let, let's By talk. the way, though, come to Oklahoma. It's a fabulous place. <laughs> <laughs> but does it go up much? No. It's okay. <laughs> um, Fanny, Fanny and Freddie, are we going to uh, have them in existence the, under their current private ownership for, for the remainder of this year? Who wants to chime in on that? You, you, I think someone said before you were talking about a bunch of rules um, done on a knee-jerk basis, I think is what is, was the exact word. And what I, I actually had a question going through my mind. Has there ever been a law or policy passed that wasn't a knee-jerk reaction? Not, not that I'm aware of. So, and this goes back to the answer to your question. Who knows? Who knows what they're going to do with Fannie and Freddie? They're clearly insolvent. They clearly will not exist in their current form, but what are they going to do about it? I don't know. I mean, it, it could be as simple as I'm simply giving them cash. They get a big preferred equity stake, and they can continue to exist at the taxpayer expense. It could be as something as dr draconian as completely taking them over, nationalizing them, giving them to the Fed, break them up in pieces, and sell them off into private companies. Who knows? Okay, go ahead. I, I've read, uh, and there, there was one piece of legislation. It was the anti-knee-jerk legislation act of 1942. <laughs> Took them seven years to pass the bill. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not picking on economists here, uh, but I have read two perfectly thoughtful, logical, well-thought dissertations in the last three days. One suggested that the absolutely correct answer was to privatize them entirely, get the government out. The other suggested that the, po the perfect solution was to have the government take them over completely. And I came away reading both of them thinking, boy, that's the right answer. Um, and and I, I think, you know, I got into a heated debate with somebody on a, on a Fox broadcast who said that Fannie and Freddie were at the heart of the foreclosure problem, which is one of the stupider things I've heard. And be because they didn't do, they didn't buy most of these loans. They would have been. If they could have been, they would have been. They would have. I mean, if yeah, they could I mean, have, they, they would have. Right? <laughs> yeah, the, the, man, the management was bad enough that yeah. I, I agree with you. So I, I think you're going to see something left because you don't just make $5 trillion go away. No, I hope not. But you know, well, we're, we're doing our darn our best. I'm doing my best by yeah, buying but, at low but, as I can. But I'm but sure. I, don't, I, don't, I, <laughs> I think if anybody has that, the, the secret formula for what's left at the end of this for Fannie and Freddie, I haven't seen it yet. You know, I guess one of why I asked the question is, okay, let's, whatever, whatever scenario plays out involves writing big checks. Is that ultimately going to be inflationary? And are we going to be looking at interest rates that are much different two or three years from now? What, what do you think? It, well, there's two ways of paying the bills. One way is to print it, print the money and, give, and pay the bills. And the other one is to issue debt. Our government still has the functional confidence of the world investor community. And as long as they continue to have that confidence, they can do all the debt they want. It won't have inflationary pressures. It's if you start to see, you know, the bottom drop out of the public bond market and treasuries start to go crazy, well, yeah, then they have to turn the printing press on. But I think the U.S. is really far from that at this point in time. Okay. That was almost bullish. Almost. <laughs> Interest rates, then, you don't expect to see interest rates uh, do anything? I, I think interest rates are doing exactly what we expected them to do. They're finally starting to reflect the risks that's out there. I mean, you're starting to see the spreads widen because guess what? The financial markets are a mess, gee. Yeah. Um, so I think that's going to be a trend that's going to continue for a while as a result of the risk that's in the market. And eventually, as this passes, they'll start to come back down again to that, no, like I said before, that new long run low level that we sort of have to appreciate. I mean. We just have to live in, we have to understand, we live in a world of diminished returns. And that's just, that's the kind of world we're moving into right now. Just, so, You know, when, when I first got into the business and refied my house at 17 and a half, and I got to refi it again at 12, and I thought it was a really good deal, and there was a lot of people that were very smart telling me that you're never going to see anything that's single digit again. And now we're, we've been really spoiled by seeing 5% interest rates, and now we're at 6 and a half, and everybody thinks that's really a bad thing. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting, uh, in, in the study of all of this, interest rates can be very high, be, be double digit, and you could still have a real estate boom as long as the monthly number still makes sense in relationship to what people make. So the price skewing down low enough would make room for an interest rate hike and it would still have a healthy real estate market if, uh, if that had to happen. You, you, uh, you 
you gave us a lecture over at Realty Track one day, which which I now quote liberally. Uh, but you were talking about you know V-shaped markets and U-shaped markets, and and one of the things you you talked about that really stuck with me was the the inflection point, which is that in most of these cycles you hit an inflection point where the prices drop far enough and the interest rates are favorable enough, and the affordability index is right, and people come off the sidelines. And and when you start talking about a 65 percent price drop and a six and a half percent interest rate, you'd figure you'd see more buyers coming to the market than what you're currently seeing. And I, I, I can't help but think that a lot of this is market psychology. Oh, absolutely. That, 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 that the lenders are afraid to lend because they don't know how far down is, and the buyers are waiting for a bottom that they can't see with a telescope. And, and I do believe that in addition to the, and I think you were the one that brought this up, Chris, in addition to the, the fact that that $300 billion FHA program is really aimed more at keeping the bank solvent than it is about keeping people in their homes, I think it's, it's trying to jolt confidence back into the marketplace and say it's okay to get back in the water because we, take, we took all the really bad sharks out. You know, one of the things that's happened this time is the velocity of the change in price has been unprecedented in, in anything I've ever studied. So this price change of 35 to 50 percent has got to shock people. As a matter of fact, they apparently aren't even unaware of it. That was what was interesting. There was a, some type of... You saw that survey? Yeah, it was or a, Zillow, like a Zillow study that showed that I think it was seven out of ten people thought their particular home was still appreciating. What's that word? You, you uh, have... <laughs> I, I, my, my, uh, the, the word I use is home hallucination. Home hallucination. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but ability, the ability to convince oneself that while the price of everybody else's home has fallen, your neighborhood is clearly different. <laughs> I'm sure every time Tommy auctions a house, he's got one of those. I, I must tell you, the ad on the Tulsa television today says exactly that. <laughs> it says all the other markets are f bad, but guess what? In Tulsa, they're going up. And that is what the ad says. <laughs> well, it's, it's nice if we feel that way because then we buy some more. So that's part of it. Phil, we have, we've talked a few times, and are lenders now skewing to so conservative that they're making they're not making loans that uh, are so safe it's ridiculous at this point. Are they not making those loans? Yeah, I mean, you can hear it. <laughs> you know, um, I think part of the magnification of the problem has been, you know, the automated underwriting, as you mentioned. You know, the automated underwriting was such a blessing because it was just one of those things that if someone had a certain credit score, certain ratio, certain income, boom, automatic approval goes straight to, and Fannie and Freddie would buy it. Now they've just, they've just you know, turned off the spigot, the water spigot. So now the credit score is both, so it's, instead of being this, needs to be this, ratios need to be this, and it's just dried it up. I can't tell you how, how often um, what I'm seeing right now, people putting 50% down. Um, I had a, have a client putting, buying a $2 million property, putting 50% down. He's been a, in the commercial, um, um, commercial broker for the past, <laughs> You know, X number of years. I feel awful for that guy. <laughs> you know. And he can't get financing because his credit score is too low. And it's just, a, it's just a point of needing to get his credit score up until he'll be fine. But, I mean, literally 50% down. I have another client right now I'm dealing with. I know a hard money lender that would go for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, we are seeing hard money lenders, literally. I mean, we, that, they're, they're, they're picking, up the, picking up the slack. Oh, my goodness. Huge, huge resource. Okay.